We are live on Facebook. Greetings, everyone. I cordially welcome you all to Rupani Foundation USS series of online seminars on early childhood development, attachment styles, and its lifelong impact on children. I'm your host, Dilshad Meghani, Community Outreach Coordinator at RFUSA. Rupani Foundation USA arranges these wonderful webinars as well as provides essential ECD services at household and community level. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our agenda for today is to discuss child development and the importance of attachment theory. Today, guest speaker, Dr. Aisha Sanubar Chachar is a well-known child consultant and adolescent psychiatrist. Dr. Sanubar will thoroughly discuss the following capstone topics. Uh, in detail based on her knowledge and experience. Number one, impact of attachment style theory on children and the caregiver. Number two, importance of good enough parenting and perfect parenting. Number three, the role of extended families in different cultural aspects. As most of you know, positive early childhood development is an effective way to break the vicious cycle of poverty within our community. RFUSA prepares young minds by involving parents, families, and communities. We believe a strong beginning ensures smooth transition into formal education, and it's a pathway towards a prosperous future. We take early childhood development as an emerging topic to eradicate poverty and perpetual human sufferings. Rupani Foundation has played a wonderful role to arrange various programs for the promotion of early childhood education and multiple supportive programs for their parents and family members. Before going in further details, let me share today's webinar agenda with you. First, we will be going over some guidelines to assist you in participating in today's event. After the introduction, our panelist and our guest speaker, Dr. Aisha, will share her presentation about early childhood development, attachment styles, and its lifelong impact on children. We will also ask you all to actively participate in our poll questions. At the conclusion of our speaker's presentation, there will be time for questions and answers from the attendees. You are requested to send your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, webinar guidelines to follow. Attendees will be muted to ensure clarity for guest speaker and panelists. Please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen for any technical issue. For the queries, simply use the Q&A box in the control panel on your screen. You may send your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them at the end of the webinar. Please be sure to ask to all panelists and attendees. We ask that you remain patient as you await to respond from our panelists. Please take a minute to complete a brief survey at the end of this webinar. <clears throat> now, I would like to discuss further about Rupani Foundation USA. RF USA is a nonprofit organization established in 2007 with an aim to create economic opportunities as well as provide services in the field of early childhood development and education in the remote and marginalized communities. Currently, the organization is working to eradicate poverty in collaboration with local, national, and international development and humanitarian agencies and government in targeted areas of Pakistan, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, and United States of America. The headquarter of Arab is based in Houston, Texas. It provides seed capital to carry out research, conduct pilots, and initiate projects in value-added sectors. The foundation also functions as a catalyst for the holistic development of an economic and social infrastructure to establish vibrant communities. <clears throat> now, it's an immense pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker, Dr. Aisha Sanobar-Chacher. 
She's a well-known consultant, child and adolescent psychiatrist. Dr. Chachar is the co-founder and director of research and clinical governance, Synapse Pakistan Neuroscience Institute as well. She has been serving in Aga Khan University in the Department of Clinical Fellowship and Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Dr. Aisha has done her medical degree in BBS, FCPS in Psychiatry and Clinical Fellowship, Child and Adolescent Psychiatry from Aga Khan University Hospital, Karachi, Pakistan. She has been a part of Berlin Group co-leader since 2007 and participated in Common Purpose South Asia Leadership Program alumni in 2017. Dr. Aisha has been also participated in fellow of Helmut Ramschmidt Research Seminar 2019. She has been achieved SCA MH Award winner for Clinical Trainee of the Year 2020. She is a former medical director at Alleviate Addiction Suffering, AAS Trust and the AAS Recovery Center, Pakistan. Dr. Chacha Surf is a peer reviewer for national and international academic journals. She has authored several academic papers and a book chapters. She is a member of the World Psychiatry Association. Early Career Psychiatrist Committee, IACAPAP Early Career Psychiatrist Task Force, UK, Bali, Society, and an international member of the American, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Before I turn it over to our speaker, I would like for you all to answer a pre poll question that's going to be pop up on your screen. We are going to offer uh, two poll questions here. So the first question should be our pre-poll questions. And you can see the questions on your screen, on your Zoom screen. So let me read, there are four questions and you're gonna answer these all questions. And at the end of this presentation, we will again launch the same questions for you. So we can relate your understanding, your knowledge after the presentation. So I want you all to participate in our this poll. Thank you. So let me read questions for you. Number one is choose what you believe is the major elements of social and emotional development among children below two years of age. So this is a multiple choice. So you have the first choice is forming secure relationship, expressing and regulating emotions. And number three is learning the discipline and number four is seeking attention. So. I'm waiting for you. I'm gonna give you a moment to click on your responses. We are just looking at question number one on our pre-poll. I can see your responses. Please click on your responses. Uh, let me go to our second poll question. Like the questions are still on the one poll, but we're gonna go to the second segment. It says, what do you believe is are important for adults to give to children? Again, multiple choice. There are four options. Number one is time, attention, digital tools. And the third, the last one is discipline when child engages in changing behavior. Again, I'm giving you a time uh, to click on your responses. Okay, with that, we are going to our third segment. It says, what do you believe about child's temperament is true? So you have again, uh, how many questions? Options four, yes. So let me read the options for you. It impacts on both parents react, respond, and attach to the child. Number second is it's biological. A child is born with it. And number third is it changes over time. And number fourth is it's how parents shape and they mold the temperament. Okay, I can see the responses. 
So we're gonna share about the responses, the result at the end. So let's go to number four. Okay, what attachment patterns impact a child transition into adulthood in a way, multiple choice? Again, so you have four options, faces problems with stress, biological and hormone uh, regulations. And the second increases the risk of intergenerational transmission after marriage. Number three is leads to several mental health problems and disorder. And number four is impact how one relates to colleagues at the workplace. So I can see your responses. So let me share the results with you. You can see the results on the screen. Uh, I have like 100 persons are uh, talking about the, according to the first question, they say that expressing and regulating emotions. According to the second question, they said that uh, time should be, we should give about the time to adult. And the third should be, the third one is sorry, it changed over time. And the fourth option is uh, faces problems with stress and biochemical and hormone regulation. So thank you so much. Thank you all for your participation in our poll questions. Okay, great. I will now turn it over to Dr. Aisha for 30 minutes. So Dr. Aisha, the floor is all yours now. Thank you so much, um, Dusha, for, for the invitation and um, such a warm introduction. Um, and it was really fascinating to see what people are actually thinking about or, or sort of like have the idea about early childhood attachment patterns. So the results were pretty um, fascinating. Yeah. So I have a presentation. I'm going to try my level best to make it brief. Um, wait, let me share. Okay, is it visible? Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Okay, and can, and can you hear me? Yeah. All right, okay. So today, I think um, the topic that we are going to discuss is something that, I'm, that I feel very strongly about. It's the early childhood um, development, something, um, and, and also like, specifically if we talk about attachment. I think it's important for us to talk about what is it that, um, an attachment, a secure attachment of a child and, and a parent mean. So um, I, I'll i start with disclaimers. There are no conflict of interest and no financial uh, interest in this presentation that I share. And um, as, as it has been shared with everyone that the idea is, I, I'll try my level best, that by the end of this talk, um, participants and people who are um, hearing this talk should be able to identify different um, areas of attachment um, of a child and, and um, a caregiver and differentiate between um, good enough parenting and perfect parenting and also the role of families and especially in our culture, the extended family. So, um, I'll be talking about, so I'll be using um, the word caregiver or a carer or, so, so this is all interchangeably with, uh, with a parent, right? Or, or let's say whoever is taking care of the child. Uh, it's important for us to understand that it's, it's really not about, I'm not talking about mother, father, or, or a foster parent per se. I'm talking about whoever is taking care of the child. So I think it's important for us to reflect upon what exactly is attachment, what is it that I'm talking about? So when I'm talking about uh, attachment, it's it's something, and it was very interesting, the result of, of um, the poll, that we have some preconceived notion about, um, you know, how, how do we attach to people? What are the interpersonal um, skills, how, how is it that we choose a certain kind of a person for, you know, to work with as a best friend or as a, as a um, life partner. Um, and and it, it's quite striking when, when I started my child and adolescent guidance fellowship and, and, some, and when I 
read up on on uh, attachment it was pretty interesting how how whatever we do in adult life is is shaped by um a childhood the early attachment patterns and this was such a profound um, um moment for me it was like in, in therapy we say aha moment it was such an aha moment for me that and 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 it, it took me a while to understand this and then it took me a while to to sort of like you know disseminate this information that please whatever you do um in in those early like years with your child and actually has a profound impact on what you do let's say at your workplace right so um for an adult i think it's important um uh, if, if we talk about attachment for an adult attachment is really about the capacity to form and maintain healthy um and, and balanced emotional relationship now the important point you know, on this slide is that it really begins to develop in early childhood something something that is so important if if, if by the end of this talk let's say you forget everything dr aisha said please remember this that whatever or however you attach to your child in your, in those early let's say five years is going to make a template for that a child to grow up and use in the in different relationships right so this brings us to to the child so for a child the emotional connection that is established between the child and whoever is providing the care is is something that is going to last long and hence early years of life are very very important and 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 please keep in mind that we are talking about attachment patterns here i'm going to use two uh, very technical terms and i'll try my level best to sort of like simplify it with that when we're talking about um attachment it's 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 very easy for for us to sort of blame parents let's say you know if something is is down and 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 you, we do see this a lot of times at at um you know social media or certain like instagram posts and then you know blogs that it's it's really like parenting bashing uh, i would say that you know, something happened in childhood and then um you know, that is causing this i i i don't negate that completely but i also have um a, a, an opinion about that in, in based on whatever um research i've done it's important to um for a parent to create or to provide that safe space but it's also there are other factors as well so um a caregiver or how a parent responds to the child is is important it's extremely important and it's going to um um sort of like uh, develop these different um patterns and um and and responses in in child's relationship with others but it's it's also important for us to understand that the child also comes with a certain temperament the, the child is born with a certain temperament so it's it's really a two way relational um i i hate to use this word but i think it's the easiest way to explain the the transactional relationship it's just not um from the parents but it's also what the child provides um that that really forms this internal working model i think it's important uh, for us to understand that child um temperament how child responds to a situation or the need and when i'm saying child i'm really talking about let's say you know um a newborn or let's uh, someone uh, a one year old or a six month old i'm talking about like like that um age so it's it's the child and then it's also the parent and how the parent uh, or caregiver responds to the need that is something that's going to make um uh, internal working model that and like simply said template for a person right um and this is going to be used for for rest of um the child's life okay so now how do we um know that if the child is securely attached or insecurely attached um and and what are the patterns that that we see i think the important um thing is if we talk about secure um attachment patterns a child who um, experiences responsive nurturing and consistent caregiving is most likely to be securely attached right so it's it's important a parent who is uh, responsive to the needs nurturing and consistent each time the, the child sort of like has some needs how does the child um, communicate the needs right by crying 
if you think about a baby, baby is not going to tell you that I'm, I'm I'm hungry or or I need to pee, right? Or I have pee. I'm, I'm I'm like clean me. That's not going to happen, right? And 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 we do see that um, like parents, mothers, fathers, they they tend to identify. It's a huge process, right? And it's a huge transformational sort of like transitional process when someone becomes a parent. So, but the important point is that are you consistent? Like, let's say one day you're available, but let's say for two days you're not. So, so that is important for us to understand that not just one weekend is going to help, it has to be consistent. And that is going to drive if the child has, or is going to um, develop a secure attachment, right? And, and um, a child who experiences, again, inconsistent, unresponsive, or insensitive care giving can develop an insecure attachment style and have an internal working model, something that I talked about earlier, a template that perceives themselves, their environment, and others negatively, or they have difficulty trusting. Right? Now, the important point on this slide is that, that if, if a child who has secure attachment um, during those early childhood um, years, is actually going to grow grow up and have uh, have very healthy, balanced, positive um, relationships in in in, in uh, different parts of life. So attachment is vital to um, childhood development. So what happens is based on my clinical experiences. If I if I tell you, a lot of times parents are concerned about physical milestones. Um, if, if the child is not able to walk, let's say, uh, or, or if the speech is delayed, that is a huge, huge sort of like stress and burden. And I'm not saying that it's not, but but the point that I'm trying to make here is that, that there are these invisible milestones that we tend to ignore. And also because we don't know, we don't know what we don't know. So so, so that is also um, important for, for us to, to realize that there are some invisible um, milestones that a, a child has to develop. And, and we, we tend to, most of the time, uh, based on my, my clinical experience, I would say, not look at that. So, um, and how, and what am I talking about? What impact am I talking about? So there's emotional um, and, and um, social milestones that a child um, goes through something that is beyond the scope of this presentation, but but that is important because that's going to develop um, the, the, the sense, the identity of, of a person when in, a, in an adulthood. What kind of a, um, colleague would you be? What kind of a partner would you be? What kind of a parent um, would you be? All of these things start right, right from um, the childhood. I would also um, say that, and, and I often, talk about this in different for us that it basically starts even before the child is born it's actually the pregnancy it's actually how the attitude of parents are they ready are they not ready to have a child are do they even want um, a child or they're having it out of uh, you know cultural and social expectations so 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 the blueprint um, is, is formed even before um, pregnancy I think it's important for us to um, understand here that when I'm saying um, attachment, attachment can easily be um, mistaken as bonding, right? And so it's important for us to understand that bonding is the way a parent, a caregiver, any adult develops an emotional connection to a child, right? So, um, you know, you you bond with the child, let's say you play with the child, you um, take, take a the child out so something that you see very commonly with with um, fatherhood fatherhood so the way fathers bond and this is all research based that um the way fathers bond to children is different is, is again culturally di driven biologically dri di driven this is a very separate debate but it's it's different um kind of a bonding as compared to mother right so attachment is 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 is, is is different from bonding because it requires a relationship between the child and and the carer. So it, so bonding is just an external way of expressing, but attachment really is about building that connection, building that relationship. Now it's also important for us um, to to understand, and this is the question that I very um, often ask in my clinical practice: that as a parent or as a caregiver, as an adult. Um, 
what is it that you want more? Do you want to discipline the child or do you want to develop a relationship with the child? Because a lot of times what happens is that when you are so focused on disciplining and then you know shaping or molding the child in a way that you want the child to be, the connection, the relationship that the child yearns for um, gets lost. So I think it's, it's important that um, attachment styles develop as, as children adapt to the behavior of their caregivers and seeking to have their needs uh, meet. So this is something that I just uh, mentioned that attachment between a child um, and, and, and uh, an adult is really not just about parenting. It's, it's, it's about um, the child's temperament. It's about how uh, consistent and responsive and sensitive the parent or the caregiver is and, and what are the needs needs of the child. I think it's, it's an important thing for us to understand. And, and it's also important for us to uh, understand that these attachment patterns are going to influence the child when they, they grow up. So um, effect, again, something um, that, that I briefly talked about, that insecure attachments and um, are, are basically driven when there is um, difficulty um, or, or when, when there is um, lack of responsive um, parenting, right? But but how does it affect your entire life? Like when I'm, when we talk about or when when I'm making or claiming this this huge um, sort of like an argument or statement that it's going to affect your adulthood, what what is it that I'm talking about? I think um, it's important for us to understand that. A, a secure attachment. Um, remember, always remember that you know, like early five uh, five years um, of, of, of development of a human life is important because the brain is developing rapidly. Secure attachment. Um, it can actually affect your brain function, right? So it's it's not something um, that that that's. Uh, coming out of blue, right? It's it's all in here. It's and, and when I'm saying it, I'm very mindful because there are a lot of like uh jokes around this that it's all in your head. I I own that. It is in my head because my brain is here. So so everything comes from the neurons, the, the synaptic connection. So the, the even the attachment, early attachment is going to affect how how the brain is developed. So um let if so these attachment, if they are not sort of taken care of in early life, they can actually affect how you uh, cope up with the stress, how you build relationships, what, your, what are your interpersonal skills, how, how successful you are in, um, in, in your life, regardless wherever you are. The important point, the, the second point, um, which I feel very strongly about is that it, is, it can increase the risk of intergenerational transmission. So um, I think two slides ago, uh, I, I just mentioned how how parenting or attachment or childhood development is affected um, when, from the time of conception, right? Before even pregnancy, if we say, or, or even when parents are thinking about having a child. So um, when I say that, I, I, um, I'm very mindful that this could be seen as I don't know, like Mambo, Jum Mambo Jumbo um, by Dr. Aisha, but it's important for us to understand that we not just um, transmit or, or let's say inherit our um, genes from our parents in a way that you know, how we look, what is the eye of uh, the color of our eyes, what is the texture of um, the hair, it's actually how, how you, you're going to um, transmit your values, your family values, Good or bad, I'm not talking about that, but but there is um, intergenerational um, transmission. And one of the commonest uh, um, examples that I can give is the stories of partition um, in, in, in Pakistan, how they are sort of like, you know, um, like they still have profound effect on young people. They don't even know what's going on with this um, neighboring country, but they have this strong sense of this, this oh, like, the example is 
India Pakistan the cricket match, right? So where is this coming from? The, the children don't know anything, but it really is the the, the transmission of intergenerational um, concepts. Um, th this is a very important slide, and why? Um, for the longest time, I would say, even up till like few few decades ago, people thought that children are um, passive learners, they are just mini adults, they don't know what's happening in their surroundings. So, you know, the adult talk is something that child are not um, supposed to listen to. Or, but, but based on my clinical experiences, I have, uh, I can very confidently say that children hear and, and see everything that you do. You cannot um, uh, think or expect that they are just passive, they are active. They they actually, it's, it's really very profound how, how children adapt to their, uh, their surroundings and how um, they pick up specific, you know, like behaviors and the way um, parents deal with, with um, stress the, and, and anger. This is something that, that makes a profound impact on, on the child. So um, again, something to reinforce that young children develop strategies to help them cope with, survive, and function in whatever caregiver environment they are in. So it could be an abusive, um, a, like a home where there is uh, domestic violence and abusive um, relationship. And um, but but the child is born. I think it's very, again a very important point. When a child is born, the child is actively seeking to survive. So when the child is crying for, for food because the, um, the language is, is not developed, the brain areas are not developed, child can't speak, right? So the child cries. And why is the child crying? Because the child wants to, it is hungry, right? It's, it's a very evolutionary way of how our brains uh, are, are really um, designed, right? So, so, so whatever the child does, the child wants to survive. So, um, so, it's, so it's, it's important for us to keep, keep that in mind. It's, and another connection um, that I'm going to make to this point is that a lot of times um, teenagers who try to harm themselves, it's, it's often seen as you know, drama. It's often seen as attention-seeking attitude. Right? It's, it's, again, a profound um, sort of explanation that, that I came across was that a, the the teenager tries to harm themselves because they want to survive. They want to act, they don't want to die, but they want to survive. And the only way of coping up with the distress is harming themselves. So imagine um, how, how um, these attachment styles can impact in ways that we don't even realize. Right. So um, as, as I said, it's, it's two way um, sort of, uh, relationship so it's not we, we cannot always blame parents um on, about child rearing practices it does have a very very important more significant share of, of impact but it's also about um how how child is um is, is sort of reacting or 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 playing playing or dancing dancing with, with the parent i think that's that's an important um thing so so, so um when, when I'm saying, again, the point that I made about the physical and, and invisible milestones, I think it, um, the, the grandparents or let's say um, the elder people in, in, in the family, they, they do tell um, newly um, like new parents that this is the age when the child is going to walk, this is the age when the child is going to speak the first word, right? Um, so, so these information or these sort of like um, knowledge is mainly given um, within the family for which um, you know, professionals are, are really um, sort of like reached out to. But um, no one talks about the anger, the, no one talks about temper tantrums, um, temper tantrums in a two-year-old. It's normal. It's completely normal. It's not but the me, but yeah, it's really uh, um, it, it is a, a way of sort of exerting the autonomy that hey, like I want it. I don't want to uh, um, surrender. Like the child is sort of like um, 
um, you know, learning. It's like a trial and error um, phase of, of a child, right? So certain behaviors are developmentally appropriate. If we can expect a two-year-old to throw a uh, temper tantrum, we can't expect a 12-year-old to um, do the same, right? Some fears, for example, fear of darkness, fear of being alone in the room is absolutely normal in a five-year-old, a six-year-old. But if that is something that happens at, let's say, 17-year-old, we can think of uh, anxiety disorders, right? So, so, so the beauty of child and adolescent mental health or child and adolescent psychiatry is that not like we have to know what is what is normal in order to differentiate what is what is abnormal. And um, a lot of times I'm I'm asked about this question that well, how come you like what is child and adolescent psychiatrist? Um, but chungu kya masle hote hain? But chungu kya nafsiyat ke masle hote hain? It's it's very uh, interesting um, because we don't even know what is normal. We don't even know what is developmentally appropriate. How come um, we like understand what is not developmentally? Right? So um, I I just mentioned not not every temper tantrum is um, but the easy. So I think it's important for us to to. Um, not label the child right why are, why am i talking about this because and especially in uh, like early childhood so labeling never helps we, we think that it uh, calling calling a child tough uh, or calling a child but the means and and um now for who is going to cause something or something would happen the child would feel that you know oh i did this wrong and then they will learn that's not how how child uh, children learn, right? It's it's Im and important for us to understand that are we unconsciously um, causing or or let's say inducing guilt? I always tell parents and and teachers when I work with um in in, in my clinic that always um, call out for the behavior never say anything uh, about the identity of the child and the example that i'm going to give you is that you did a bad thing versus you are a bad boy so the, these two things have profound um, implications if, if the child keeps on uh, hearing that i'm a bad boy i'm a bad boy eventually that is going to become the the reality of, of that child and um and when i'm saying reality it's it's the conditioned self not the authentic self that the, the child grows up with. And, and then there is no alternative reality or, or, or explanation. So, so the child sort of embraces that identity. So, um, so it, it, it's important for us to not uh, induce shame by, by labeling just because we don't know. So um, again, I think it's important for us to uh, understand the possible reasons for why the child is behaving in inappropriate ways, right? um again how would we know if we uh, don't know what is appropriate at what age right so what we do is we blame the child um and and not always the response but the child um and then we, we often see that it's also um the parenting that gets the blame for it's also the, the the family background that the child gets blamed from oh you from, from this family oh your parents are your mother is working so of course um, your family doesn't have a grandmother so 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 I, we, I think it's important for us to understand what exactly is happening in the moment rather than just you know, quickly sort of um, getting to the conclusion sustain and consistent interest affection care and positive regard for a child's achievement can increase resilience one of the most important factors that drives how a person or a, or a, or how successful a child would be in adulthood is is the um how, how is the resilience how resilient is is the child right but but how does one become resilient so yes um, partially um, temperament of, of the child, but also how we respond to the child's need is actually going to, to drive how uh, resilient uh, the child can uh, be as when the child grows up. So, yeah. I especially want to talk about infancy because when I'm saying childhood, people 
often think about uh, the four, five, six, seven, eight years of, of, of uh, child, childhood. But infancy is, is very um, important, I would say, but neglected um, field of, of mental health as well. Like when, when, when people hear infant mental health, they are actually sort of like, I've seen a lot of eye rolls that what is infant mental health? How can an infancy uh, influence mental mental health? So, so uh, yes. okay. So I think it's important for us to understand that um, yes, um, an infant can be healthy physically, but is also psychologically or mentally healthy infant. So it's it's important that and when I'm saying infancy, infancy is the first year of, of um, childhood development. So what happens during that that time period? So the child is able to form close and secure interpersonal relationships. So um, I'm sorry, the child are are you referring to? Okay, I thought you're saying something. You want to say? Are something? you saying something? No, no, I'm not saying anything to you. Okay, okay, all right, sorry. Okay. okay. So uh, during the first year of, of childhood, it's 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 um, very interesting how the child is sort of um, developing these social connections. Um, there are a lot of research done when the child is just born. Um, they can actually identify the um, the the voice of mother and 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 the father, right? So um, so that is the time period where, where it's important for us to focus on close and secure interpersonal uh, relationships that a child can develop. And that is that is the um, that is the year when when the child is sort of like learning how to walk, sort of, and 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 um, learning how to sit. So it is really adapting to the environment and it is learning and exploring the surroundings. It's, it's important for us to um, keep in mind the, the cultural and, and, and fa um, family and social sort of expectation. The child would have a very different expectation, let's say, um, in, in Africa as compared to in, in, in uh, Pakistan or let's say as compared to anywhere in Europe, right? So um, we, and, 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 and this is an important point that a lot of these theories and in these um, uh, research are coming from um, developed countries, right? And not everything can be in, uh, implemented in, in, in our culture. So it's important for us to understand the context of family, community, and, and culture. Um, and, and again, during that um, one year, healthy social and emotional development is, is, is constantly happening that we don't even realize how. So um, yeah, this is this is um, interesting. So when a child is, is is born, they they want to relate, they want to sort of um, um, attach. So so that that is something very evolutionary, very very biologically sort of um, way the brain are wired or, or, or programmed, right? So it's it's an where it's a point of where the the role of parents and, and caregivers, family um, becomes crucial. It, it's um, the, the first thing that I learned in child and adolescent psychiatry was that it takes a village to, to raise a child. Right? Um, so, so, so it's important um, that, that way. Parenting quality is, is important. We talked about how they should be responsive, how um, the caregiving should be consistent and sensitive. Right. And social and physical circumstances are important, and there are sensitive and critical periods that are uh, that drive milestone. Um, here, I think I am going to um, make one one important point that um, it really is not about money. A lot of people, a lot of people think that it's living in in you know um, in, in worst um, sort of like. Uh, Socioeconomic um, sort of like um, you know family is, is is going through some financial sort of uh, concerns or um, they can't provide what what everyone else supposedly is providing in, in, in their um, society so that is going to create some child and adolescent mental health related issues that is one myth that I really want to debunk today, uh, today that 
it's not about um, money. It's really not about buying um, iPhone or iPad to, for, your, for your child. It's really about how secure you make them feel. I have, uh, based on my clinical experiences, I've seen people who are not very like financially uh, well off, but the way they have dealt with, with, with the demands the child makes is so profound. And, and for me, that is role modeling um, at its best. It's, it, it's really the parental um, sort of like a reaction to, to things. If, if, the, if the parent is not comfortable with, with whatever money um, the parent has, if the parent is not comfortable, however, whatever car they're driving, it's really going to translate unconsciously, if you're not saying it out loud, to, um, to, to the child. Right. And if, if the, the parent is, is very sort of like comfortable in, in, in their skin with whatever they have, right, um, it, it, it's really going to drive how, how comfortable the child is going, going to be. So I think that's, that's important. Um, spoiling your child with giving whatever or by not saying no is actually going to spoil the, the um, entire life of the child, right? So they have to learn to, to be comfortable with uh, no, and 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 you do see that um, in in adulthood and people around you. You know there are people, um, there are friends, there are colleagues that that have difficulty saying no. So 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 it's not that you know over overnight it it, it happens. It really comes from how 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 were you sort of like um, raised as 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 a child? Was was there an option of saying no to your parents' needs? Um, was there an option of of expressing what you wanted in your early childhood so that that drives um adulthood responses so um again like these, these are some um very um uh, generic milestones that i'm talking about um so during during first year um so, so the, the the child is actually learning the basics of language now it's important for us to understand that language is not just about talking so, so the major component of, of, of language development um, is your nonverbal cues, right? How you communicate with your body, with your eye contact. So, so, so although the brain is still developing, the, the, the part of the brain that is responsible for speech and language is, is, is developing during five years, but, but there are other nonverbal communication that a child um, sort of learns during that first, uh, first year. Um, again, attachment um, is, is something that uh, is important. Now, during the second year, the language and symbolic play is, is important. Now, the child has learned how to walk, is going to explore, is going to put things in, 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 in his mouth um, and, and that, that he's not supposed to and, and sort of like would, would consider a, a ball as, as, a, as something to eat. So. So this is really, this is a very beautiful year, the, the second year of, of life, because this is about trial and error. This is exploring. Now I can walk, right? First, before that, I was not able to walk. Now I can walk. Now let me see what's happening around me. But this is also the time period where the child is, is exploring, but is looking for, for, for a consistent parent or adult to go back to. Because and, and so so a safe heaven is something the child is looking looking for. So yeah, this is um, second year, third and and uh, fourth year. So whatever is has happened between first and second year in terms of attachment, in terms of development, that is going to now sort of like uh, re um, consolidate or reinforce during um, third, fourth, and fifth year of, of life. Child is going to develop a sense of self, right? The child is going to sort of um, identify the needs and not say anything to anyone because that's uh, when he or she used to cry in, in childhood. No one, a consistent parent was not there. So that is going to be whatever happened in first and second year is going to be um, expanded, right? So, um, yeah, these are some of the um, areas that, that are important when we have to look uh, or when we are talking about developing healthy and secure attachments, right? As I said, like uh, what, what, how, what was the attitude during the time of conception? What was um, the attitude of uh, grandparents at, at the time of conception? Um, how did the pregnancy go during the pregnancy if, 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 if uh, mother um, does not have um, you know, a 
of good nutrition, the mother is going through stress and, and, and a psychosocial adversity that's going to develop, that's going to affect mother's um, stress uh, circuit in the brain. And that is going to actually affect the, the child that is inside mother, mother's womb. Um, sort of like um, develop the HPA access, um, very technical term, the, the stress circuitry in the brain um, to be that way. So, um, so again, losses of, or, or significant family difficulties, early childhood. Um, if, if we, we think that children don't know how to respond to death. We, children don't know what is, what is um, death, but it's immense, the literature out there is immense how, how um, young, very young children respond to um, loss, right? They might not be able to say, oh, I'm, I'm um, grieving but it's a very um, behavioral way of, of uh, expressing, right? So attachment figures are important. It really, I mean, it's again, one of the very profound things that um, Child and Adolescence Guide Dream taught me was it, the concept of like um, tired parents, right? Like, like, you know, there has to be a mother and father, right? There has to be like the mother, mother or father, father, like two, two people to, to sort of like, um, influence the the parenting and childhood development but that is not always the case and also not true one single attachment um pattern or or, or a effective attachment uh, figure is good enough for for a child's development yeah i can see um the chat you yeah 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 i can hear you mm -hmm. okay all right okay so um and this is this is again an important point um biopsychosocial so a lot of times um I, I'm, I'm asked when i give my consultation especially initial consultations that why one hour and all you have to do is write the prescription right write write the medicine um but and and my response to that is that you know yes there are some biological psychiatrists but then there are some psychiatrists who are very biopsychosocially driven and when i say that what um, like I, what I mean is this: right? that biological um, way of looking at, at things, very, very sort of like genetic and neurobiological, is, is important, definitely, and that actually drives a lot of um, uh, areas in your childhood development. But we can't ignore psychosocial aspects, right? But uh, but in context of uh, attachment, um, when when I'm using this biopsychosocial model, what I'm really focusing uh, on is the child is born with a temperament. The child also brings in um, a certain um, sort of like um, baggage in, in this world, number one. Um, and, and the temperament is really sort of driven how, by, by the genetics, the family uh, history, the, the, the time period, the stress, the nutrition during, during the pregnancy. So all of these things actually drive child's um, temperament, right? Then um, psychological uh, factors. So again, now we are focusing on parents, right? So if, if, the, if the child is born and the mother is, is going through postpartum depression, something that happens very commonly and goes undetected, that can affect the, the, the initial bonding of, of child and, and mother, right? Um, so again, how is the, the personality traits of parents or caregivers and, and attachment style, and then social. I think one of the, points that is usually is sort of not taken well is the importance of uh, extended family. It is, um, if, if it is utilized in a way that um, is, is effective, I think extended family is a blessing, right? But this extended family, if it's not sort of like giving that space to parents to be, to, to sort of like um, develop that secure attachment with the child can also be a curse. So again, the pendulum can go either way. So yeah, okay. I think this is something for for um, us to reflect upon. That um, when when let's be okay. So I think it's important for all of you to think about your own childhood. Right? Just just think about your four year old version and 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 reflect how your needs were met when you were four years old, right? How, how were you the one who would have to ask or were things given to you before even you 
considered of or asked. So how, how were your needs met? Right? And who was meeting those needs? It's important, again, this is the, the point that I made, that it's not just always about mother and father. You can have a grandparent that you're uh, attached to. You can have one um, khala or, or chacha. So uh, who, who exactly um, was meeting um, your need? How do you think your sense of self and um, obligation towards your, your family and social expectations, cultural ex expectations, how do you think they were formed and supported? And, and um, one of the very profound questions um, that, that I was asked during my training was that when you were um, in, in your childhood, were you allowed to um, lock your door? your room's door. So there's a huge difference uh, between how, how this, this um, specific question is, is uh, answered in Western and the de developed countries versus in, in Eastern and, and um, uh, more traditional cultures where, where children and teenagers are not allowed to lock their doors. <laughs> so um, these, these are the things that actually drive and impact. So um, again, as like I'm, I'm just reinforcing um, the the fact that it's really not about um, how just uh, about parents. Right? It's really about the the relationship between um, the child and the parent. And this is the question that has been asked by a child psychoanalyst a lot. That who is when when you're working with children, who is your patient? Right? Because like majority of the time you're working with um, parents, right? So, um, and, and the answer to it, which I personally feel is, is the um, best answer to this, is the relationship between the child and, and the parent is the patient. It's the relational aspect that, that is the um, patient, right? So, um, yeah, I, okay. So I, I think it's important for us to, um, like all, all of these things are important, what I'm saying, but how to translate these into more tangible um, sort of ways, right? So uh, the focus has to be on parents' ability to nurture, right? To, to sort of interpret. And now how do we interpret? What is the child asking for? And what do we do if the child is in pain, let's say, or, or is, is hungry and, and, and the father or a mother is very busy and, and frustrated? And, and is now angry at the child, that why are you crying? And, and a lot of times it happens, you know, the mother slaps and the father sort of like beats the child. So are we able to interpret the, the language of the child? Crying is a behavior, a cr the crying is the communication to, to adults. So, um, and once we interpret the, that, uh, are we able to respond to that um, sensitively and appropriately and then help um, mentalize? It's a very, um, a technical term, um, and I'm, I'm not going to get into mentalization, but I think um, coming to child's ability, I think it's important um, that the child is able to uh, indicate me what is it that I want. One of the things that, that uh, has happened, and I've observed very, very, um, as, as a very prevalent thing, that um, we have difficulty naming emotions. And why do we have difficulty naming emotions? Because during our childhood, we were taught how to how to name colors, but we were never taught to uh, name emotions, right? So a lot of times, the child doesn't even know what the child needs or, or, or is feeling. It's because it, it's not talked about. When someone is crying, a child is crying. Child is hushed. Just the child is asked not to sort of like, you know, um, make a fuss so so the focus has to be you know helping the child to sort of um, explain the need identify the need right and then accept and respond to parental care as i said it's two-way communication we cannot bash parents all the time and then it's important for us to let the child explore freely if, if the child wants to just play play and and um and that's something that you can ignore, then let's just, like we pick your battles as, as parents. You don't um, pick on everything because it's gonna be hard for, for you. 
So, yeah. Um, when to worry when we talk about um, attachment style. I think it's um, important when, when um, we're talking about very, very young children that if you see that, that despite of tending to be a need that the child is having very frequent temper tantrums or is, is not reacting at all, it's completely withdrawn. Um, one of the important um, points that, that I've seen is that when, uh, when children become parents, it's called um, parentification of the child. Um, so a lot of times you will see that, that mothers or let's say fathers, they, they, um, they are tended by, um, emotionally by their children. They don't even realize. This is something that, that you, know, you must have heard very, very commonly. But um, let's say if it's a situational, so, so that is okay. But if it's constant that, you know, the child is acting like um, an adult and responding to uh, adult needs, as, as, at the end, this is what I mean by um, role reversal, that becomes problematic. That becomes the child's identity. That if I don't take care of others, I'm not needed. If I don't, you know, um, please others, I'm, I'm, I'm rejected. So that becomes the identity. Um, I think I can't. Um, so again, in the infant and child, um, and I'm talking about infancy, like very, like a, for initial year of, of childhood. Um, those children who are not able to grow and thrive, right? Uh, children with delayed milestones and and children who who gets uh, who are very hyper or colicky baby is something that that uh, the word is used crying all the time um and and um and is not attended there is um, the the biorhythm is is, is um, disturbed they're not able to um uh, respond to um the, uh, even when the parent is trying to soothe is not able to uh, make the connection, the relationship. So all of these things are important, um, and 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 this is one of the very like, one of the very common um, scenarios that that uh, that we see is in autism, right? So when we are talking about autism spectrum, it's it's some um, it's it's the relational aspect, it's the attachment way that a parent is expecting from a child, and and the child is not able to um, reciprocate. Again, um, when it comes to parents, I think um, um, it's important for us to reflect um, that if the, if the parent is not able to recognize the need, if the parent is um, going through a psychiatric illness, as I, like I give you the example of uh, um, postpartum depression, um, and parents who, who do not understand or do not have insight into into a child's problem, right? in spite of someone pointing it out, they, they don't understand this, right? They don't engage, even if they do come, because a lot of times this, the referrals that we get is from like schools that have asked parents to bring their child to us. Um, so uh, just like they do, they, uh, even after the initial um, consultation, it's very hard for, for some parents to engage in the treatment process, right? Um, so child incorporated in parental delusional system. So this is all coming from if someone has a, a psychotic disorder. One of the things that we see very, very common in, and, and the way it's portrayed in the media that um, a mother kills so many like um, children and then um, dies by suicide. So, and the way it has been explained and demonstrated um, is, is, is like, you know, the mother is cruel, the mother is horrible, but no one talks about filicide. No one talks about how that mother actually uh, needed the psychiatric help, right? So, um, yeah. Um, so we talked about the child, we talked about the parent. Now this is the, this is the context, this is the, 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 the environment, right? Um, so, Absence of uh, any any secure and, and protective adult in the surroundings, culture or social isolation, I would say. Um, a minimal um, or a lack of social support. There is constantly um, like domestic violence, and 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 in, in school, there is like we see a lot of times that there is 
significant and horrific amount of violence by the teachers to children. And, and also uh, commu by community violence, we see as, um, cases where there's wars and um, happening and in certain sort of neighborhoods. So all of these things are important. Like multiple social risk and, and then chronic stress. As an adult, I think it's important um, to to know what is it that that you can do, what is it that I can do for children uh, in our surroundings. I think um, a well functioning in, uh, involves significant adults. And and when I'm saying well functioning, that means functioning and um, emotionally, occupationally, socially, socially in fam in, in, in family. So it's important to have 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 that uh, mature and and. Um, adult person in your surrounding. So if, if, if you're not the one, it's easy for me to say, um, it's, it's important to develop social support. If you have a support and if you're not utilizing it as an adult, as a parent, you're not helping yourself, you're not helping your, your child. Um, if, if you think there is um, professional um, assessment needed, please, please do. Please do seek, um, services, it's it's not every psychiatrist, not every child psychiatrist is you know, quick to a jump to prescribe medicine. There's a lot that goes on, right? Um, and it's important to um, develop some activities, some routine activities with, with the child that the child looks forward to. Friday is my day, right? Like, let's say Thursday is my, my day, something to look forward to. And then actively work on developing skills. Uh, and I'm talking when I'm saying skills, it's seen as extracurricular activities, but they are not extra. They are co-curricular activities that I'm talking about, right? So yeah, I think that's that's about it. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Aisha, for sharing your knowledge and such a beautiful and valuable information you share with our attendees. So let us go with the same poll question. So we're going to uh, evaluate your learning after presentation. So you can see the same questions in the polls on the uh, Zoom screen. So question one, again, I'm going to ask, uh, choose what you believe in the major elements of social and emotional development among children below two years of age. So you have, again, multiple questions. So let's see your responses now. Forming secure relationship, expressing and regulating emotions, learning the discipline, and seeking attention. So, can you uh, click on your responses? I'm going to give you a moment to click on your responses. So, on question number one. Okay, so let's go to second questions on the same poll. What do you believe is are important for adults to give to children? So again, multiple questions. Okay, so again, there are four options, time, attention, digital tools, and discipline when children engage in challenging behavior. <laughs> Let's go to our third poll question. What attachment patterns impact a child transition into adulthood in a way? So multiple choice again, four options are here. Faces problems with stress, biochemical and hormones regulation. And number two is increasing the risk of intergenerational transmission after marriage. And the third one is leads to several mental health problems and disorder. And the last one is impact shows, sorry, impact how one rel uh, relates to colleagues at the workplace. So I'm waiting for your responses now. Okay, so according to the first one, so all the attendees like 100% are agreed with forming secure relationship. Thank you for your uh, responses. And the, in the second one, uh, the important, for adults to give to children is time, attention. And so like 50% are agree with attention and the 50% are saying time. In the third one, uh, okay. 
So you can see the result on the screen. So in the third one, our uh, attendees are agreed with like 50%. Again, it's important on how parents react, respond and attach to the child. And it, uh, it changes over the time. In the last one, they are agreed with like 100% says that impacts how one relates to colleagues in the workplace. Thank you all for your participation. Okay, so uh, we will now open the floor for your questions. So we got so many questions and then now I'm going to ask my first questions because we are running out of time now. So my first question from Ms. Shana, she's just asking that, can you speak, uh, Ms. Ch Dr. Chacher, can you speak on the Montessori method of child development and how it relates to attachment? Dr. Chacher, can you hear me? Huh. So um, when we're talking about different um, styles and patterns of, of um, attachment, so um, a lot of research has, has been done, different uh, frameworks um, has, has been, um, have been um, proposed, right? So um, the way I sort of like see these things, I mean, there are classifications, there are like organized, um, dis disorganized, secure, uh, insecure, neglectful uh, types of um, attachment styles, parenting styles, um, and, and how they sort of, uh, you know, tied with what kind of temperament, uh, easy, difficult, or, um, um, yeah, so um, easy, difficult, and, and um, slow to warm up kind of temper. So these are different um, temperament styles of the child, and then there are different styles of, of attachment, parenting styles. Um, but but the, the way I see it, the way I um, sort of like connect all of these things is really catering to individual child and, and parents um, situation, right? The relational aspect to it, the, the, the different sort of like context to, to the problem, so um, when when we sort of work with, with children, a lot of times we do not have DSM five category like uh, clinical depression, generalized anxiety um, disorders. A lot of times we work with uh, child and parent relational problems, right? So this is again um, a, a certain um, diagnostic um, category in, in DSM five. But but it's it's easy for us to sort of like have those styles to understand those styles at the back of our mind to just to, to sort of understand the situation but when it comes to like assessment and, and when it comes to sort of like uh, treatment and management of, of the situation I tend to not sort of like not put things into into the boxes um, it's important for me to know but but um yeah that's 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 how I address Thank you so much. Thank you for your detailed answers. So we got so many questions. So let me skip those questions who are already um, uh, discussed in the presentation. So there are like few more questions. They're really interesting one. Here's a mom, she is asking about her child. She uh, He has four years old child and she's uh, concerned about the attachment thing. Definitely she's saying that the child was separate from her, like when it was an early childhood, like first year, second year, and, and like in the third year, she's with a child and now the child cannot communicate properly. So he can read, he can, like he can use the digital stuff like the, the computer, whatever he can do, but he cannot communicate properly the sentences. So she's worried and she's asking about that. After your presentation, she's thinking, if, how can I overcome this one? If um if I understood it correctly, um so this is a four year old um child who has not developed speech and language um, skills completely. That's something that's expected of a four year old, right? Um, I was not able to understand what um the first year like so something happened in, during the first year. In the so first year, the child was separated because of the moms was swearing, leaving somewhere else due to her job and something. So he was with the family. So due to maybe the gap, you are talking about the attachment theory. So she cannot understand the same. Though the child is a normal child. Okay. Yeah. So again, um, it's a very important point, and and I'm glad someone asked this, um, because 
a lot of times working mothers are blamed for things that are some very developmentally appropriate right as i as i said two year old would make like would have uh, temper tantrums they have nothing to do with not having a grandmother in family it has nothing to do with having a um, single parent or a working mother um again as i mentioned that it's important to have one um, secure attachment figure in your surrounding um to to create that that template right now um if, if if everything is normal in terms of you know um the relationship behaviors well, i don't think this is something to worry about but if the speech and language is delayed that has less to do with mother was away for for a year and more to do with other sort of factors and the speech and lang uh, language evaluation is something that would be very helpful right Thank you. Great. And thank you, Ms. Kiran, for your questions. We hope this will help you. Our next question is from Mehit. So she's asking that, can you explain more in detail about trigger words like no to avoid when creating attachment? Please. Trigger words. Okay. So no. I think it's important. It's very, very important for um, a parent or an adult to say no, as, as I mentioned. Um, and, in, in my presentation that if the child doesn't learn how to um, respond to a no and, or, and how to sit with that you know, restlessness and anxiety that, oh, I have to wait now for my turn, then then the child is not going to um, develop the, 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 that, that sort of uh, sense of you know, tolerance and then patience and, and adulthood. So yes, it is a very sort of like a, a challenging situation. Right? And it is triggering, definitely, but it has a huge and profound uh, importance and significance uh, when you are raising, raising a child. So the child has to listen to no, uh, but you have to pick your battle. What, what is it um, that you um, can, um, or your family values um, can take, and what is it that people are there? So no is good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. So we value all your questions. So let's process another one about how can grandparents or others in the household reinforce the attachment in newborns? And what can parents teach grandparents to help understand reinforcement techniques? Can you please just look at this question? How can, uh, the second part of the question is how can parents- And what teach, can parents teach grandparents to help understand reinforcement techniques, like reinforcement techniques? Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, Yes, two parts of the question. Um, the first one uh, was how can uh, grandparents support? And then the second second is how can uh, sort of like parents deal with the situation where they want to have consistent rules, parent um, um, sort of like behavioral interventions, reinforcement, but it's really hard to um, convince um, grandparents. Something that happens very, very commonly, father says no, mother, like if, if uh, mother says yes, if by chance they both are on the same page, the, the grandparent sort of gives in, right? So it's a, it's a tricky situation, but very, very common situation, very common situation that we see in clinical, like I see in clinical population and non-clinical population. I think as I, as I said, it's, it's very important, the grandparents have a very important role in, in um, childhood development, right? And, and um, it, again, as I said, the, 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 the imprint of, of parenting starts right from um, the time of conception. The, the, the way parents are um, raised in their childhood, the, uh, the, the way parents have, have formed attachment with their parents is going to drive a lot of their parenting uh, ways, right? So again, if, if, if that is secure, the base is secure, of course, the, the uh, the relationship between grand uh, children and grandparents is um, so that that's how I see it. But if, if the relationship between grandparents and parents um, is uh, is a restraint, right? So that is uh, even if things are right, even if grandparents are saying the right thing, it's gonna be it's gonna be effective. So um, so family dynamics um, play a huge role. How can parents um, sort of uh, teach? I don't know if, if, if uh, parents can teach their parents um, 
um, reinforcement, but I think it's important to have a conversation. Communication is the key. Explain why you want to do this. Explain it has nothing to do with, with power um, uh, differences. A lot of times, why does it happen that if the, if the parent is saying no um, and, and the grandparent says yes? Um, at, the, at the core of this, this situation, it's really about who's in charge, who's in control, right? So, right. so if you have, if parents have this, this conversation, an honest conversation with their parents, that it's really not about who's in control, who's in charge. It's really about having, have, um, sort of shaping the behavior of, of, of the child. So I think we can start from that, that place. Thank you, Dr. Aisha, for your kind responses to so many amazing questions. So I think that concludes our q and portion of this webinar. If you were unable to ask your questions, please feel free to contact us on our social media platforms for more information. Once again, I'm glad that you took your precious time and joined us. I hope you got something fruitful from our online webinars. We will conduct our virtual webinars in future as well as we'll highly appreciate your presence. I am also grateful for RF panelists and our guest speaker, Dr. Aisha Sanubar Chacher. Your presence added more charm to our webinar. Finally, your feedback means a lot to us. So please take a few seconds to fill out the survey at the conclusion of our webinar and give us suggestions so that we will improve our further events online as well as in person. We ask that you all stay connected with us for any information you needed or any related questions, please contact us at Rupani Foundation USA for more information and type an email to dmeghani at rupanifoundationusa.org. If you want to approach Dr. Aisha Sanubar Chacher, please visit her on aisha.chacher at synapse.org.pk. You can also do this by liking and following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Lastly, I'm going to present my humble gratitude to all our participants in RFUSA team for making this online event very useful and successful. Thank you everyone for your participation and encouragement. See you soon with another innovative session. Take care, bye. Thank you, Dr. Chacher. Thank you so much. Thank you.